Loss of control in flight is the number one cause of fatal aircraft accidents around the world. And, and seriously, uh, it is. And it's, it's been, and, and these gentlemen are going to talk about it shortly, about the uh, continuing problem. To counter that risk, there has been a great deal of focus over the past several years on refining pilot training, specialized training, aimed at helping pilots recognize the onset of an aircraft upset and recovering from it as promptly and safely as possible. As is the case for virtually all safety-related concerns, ALPA is right in the thick of the endeavor to improve how pilots are trained for upset recovery. And no one in our association is more involved than the ASO's Aviation Safety Chair and former Human Factors and Training Committee Chair, Captain Chuck Hogeman. And Chuck is moderating our next panel of subject matter experts from government and industry to talk about every aspect of upset training, including the manufacturer's design philosophies, simulator development for upset recovery training, and pilot's participation in creating a greater operational safety in this difficult area. But before we hear from Chuck, allow me to put a personal stamp on this, if you will. Last February, I had a chance to travel to Oklahoma City and observe our ASO Training Council up close and personal as they convened a meeting of all the interested stakeholders moving forward toward the implementation of the new regulation in the spring of 2019. And I'll tell you, I was blown away by the level of knowledge, expertise, and talent, and the commitment by the members of this body who were there in attendance at that meeting. It's phenomenal what we do. And from that long day in Oak City, along with our talented video communications folks sitting in the back today, we put together a nine-minute video about the meeting and the upcoming implementation of the new training requirements. And you can see the full video at alpa.org uh, slash ASO News. But for now, here's just a little tease. Loss of control in flight. Finding a way to effectively address this problem has been a topic of discussion in our industry for decades. This is a special meeting that we're holding in Oklahoma City here in Kiami uh, because of the simulators that we have available to dedicate this session to our upset prevention and recovery training. This new model that uh, the FAA has developed with industry and the vendors is uh, proven to be a, a great training device. It was fantastic. It was a great experience. I've heard um, a lot of the industry groups talk about the training and increasing the simulator envelope and everything, and today was a hands-on experience where I got to experience a simulator who had had the advanced model inserted and got into a full stall. Stall, stall. It was uh, pretty intense. It was a pretty intense session. It can happen to you, and this is a, a very important skill set um, that every pilot should have in their back pocket to know how the airplane handles and reacts uh, when the airplane has been disturbed. Uh, I have to be totally honest with you. I've been waiting for this conversation for months. This is, uh, this is going to be a, a good one. Uh, and I always look forward to talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that's flying airplanes, and uh, talking about how to fly them when things don't go as we planned. As you saw in the video, in-flight loss of control mitigation and upset recovery training has become an important topic for airlines and pilots during the past 20 years. This as the result of some tragic outcomes of some notable accidents such as U.S. Air 427 in Pittsburgh, 1994, American 587 taking off of John F. Kennedy Airport in 2001. Of course, we heard from the NTSB chairman about Colgan 3407 on approach to Buffalo in 2009, and of course, uh, Air France 447 over the Atlantic that same year. Both airline pilots and casual observers fully understand that aircraft upsets can be caused by a variety of factors. An undesired aircraft state can occur from wake turbulence from a preceding aircraft, a flight control system failure, 
environmental conditions, such as in-flight icing or convective turbulence, and of course, over-reliance or misunderstanding of automation and flight instrumentation. You know, the old adage that you heard this morning was, when we train pilots, we train them to aviate, navigate, and communicate. But with new and very sophisticated aircraft being produced that operate in a very complex air traffic control system environment, that uh, adage takes on new meaning. For years, the airlines and regulators have collaborated to identify training techniques that address in-flight loss of control, and the developers don't really spend a lot of time on why aircraft upsets occur. Instead, they focus on what to do if it does occur. As the demographics of a new generation of airline pilots enter the industry, many of these new pilots may not have a great deal of actual flight experience. And unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of being able to train all airline pilots to be flight test pilots. We will need to ensure that upset recovery training is developed by focusing on a reasonable sample of upset scenarios and recovery techniques that adequately prepares a pilot to retrieve key cognitive and motor skills required to return a disturbed aircraft to a steady state. The video and introduction that we just showed you was shot at the ALPA Training Council, as Mark alluded to, in Oklahoma City earlier this year. The ALPA Training Council comprises of our ALPA training representatives, and we joined with training management and the FAA where the state of, the, of this crucial training was discussed. And as Mark mentioned, our members and other participants got a preview of academic and enhanced simulator training that will be required of all airline pilots in 2019. Just for some clarification, for the sake of this afternoon's discussion, we'll use FAA guidance to define a transport aircraft upset as an unintentional attitude excursion where pitch attitude exceeds 25 degrees nose up, 10 degrees nose down, 45 degrees of bank, or in any case where the aircraft's airspeed is inappropriate for conditions. We are privileged to get the perspectives from three prominent aircraft manufacturers and the FAA on this subject. I'm going to start it out by letting each of them spend a few minutes discussing their viewpoints, and we should have some time left over to have you join in the discussion with some of your questions. Today, we hope to help answer the question, what can we train, what should we train? So I'd like to begin the conversation. Uh, I'll start first by introducing our panel. Um, on the panel, to my uh, left is Captain Mark Parisis, Airbus. He is the Vice President of Training and Flight Operations. Captain John Stanis, Boeing 737 Fleet Manager. Captain Jan Abreu, Embraer, Instructor Pilot for the Commercial Aviation Services Support. And certainly last but not least, Dr. Jeffrey Schrader, U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, Chief Scientist for Flight Simulation. So let's begin. Mark, I'd like to start with you and have you kind of give us some perspective from Airbus on where you see uh, us going with upset recovery training and in-flight loss of control mitigation. Yes, uh, thank you, Chuck. So first, let's say that I'm very happy to be on stage, uh, sharing the stage with my colleagues from other manufacturers. This is really the way we want to work in a collaborative way when we talk about safety. It's obviously the same thing you are doing yourself in this room, being from different airlines, but we are part of the same community and our goal is really to enhance flight safety. And that's actually what we did on this very specific subject of upset recovery, starting in 98. So in 98, we all together, uh, Boeing, uh, Armour Air, at the time also McDonnell Douglas, uh, Bombardier and Airbus, we uh, set up the first upset recovery training aid. So once again in 98. And then we have a major revision in 2008 when we added supplement for high altitude uh, upset recovery training. And actually in the very uh, few days, in the coming days, so I'm not talking in terms of weeks, days, uh, we will all together issue a revision free and this uh, revision free uh, that will be available very, very soon uh, has some change. The, the main change we have inside that is we really want to insist on prevention. So actually we changed the name, so the new name is Upset Prevention and Recovery Training Head. 
And we also introduce uh, some uh, specificity for the uh, straight wing propeller regional jet. Uh, and also we all together agree to set up some simple recommendation, what we call the recovery techniques. So you will have two uh, recovery techniques. We insist it's not a procedure, it's a techniques on a recovery, a nice uh, nose high or nose low uh, situation. So uh, I think you already understand uh, where we stand uh, in Airbus, but once again sharing that with our colleagues, is that the primary objective is really to act as soon as an indesired aircraft state starts to occur. So early recognition with early recovery. This is really our primary goal. This is what we want to do. And actually we, have, uh, we are not using anymore this very specified pitch angle. We are talking about this uh, 25 degrees pitch angle. Uh, we just call about upset every time there is the beginning of undesired aircraft state that need recognition and action from the pilots. So really focusing on prevention. So once again, a very collaborative work with other aircraft manufacturers like we did in 2010 uh, to set up the new uh, stall recovery procedure. Uh, now, uh, how we want to train it. So as said by Chuck, there are new training requirements that will apply in 2019 for you in the US. That means we uh, have been facing change in the simulation regulation, part 60 this year, and asking for uh, ourselves as manufacturer new data package. So that's what we have been working. We provide simulation data package to the simulator manufacturer. And then we are providing new enhanced simulator package for all our aircraft types that will be available before the end of this year. So the enhancement start with the stall buffet model. We have been providing since the beginning uh, data to the simulator manufacturer for them to set up the buffet, stall buffet model in their simulation. Actually, we have been uh, looking at some simulator and we were not satisfied with the outputs. The data that has been transmitted were not well computed for the output of the buffet. So our decision is now to, well, starting at the end of this year, we will not give any more on the data, so it means technical note. We will provide simulation software package. It means that we are doing the activity and we provide a specific software package that when you will have the input in terms of angle of attack, in terms of Mach number, we are providing the outputs for this uh, software simulator package, the output in terms of buffet. And uh, I think this is really essential. Obviously, you also need to have a right tune of the motion for each, any and each of the simulator. But we really think that this will enhance the awareness. Uh, keep in mind that, uh, for example, on the 320, when you are at high altitude, the first indication of stall will be aircraft buffet, natural aerodynamic buffet. It will not be the uh, audio stall warning. We do not have a MAC correction uh, on the stall warning for this high MAC, high altitude situation. Uh, so uh, it's very important for each pilot to really recognize uh, the buffet to act and correct as soon as possible uh, the incoming stall. We also, in this new data package, we have enhanced aerodynamic model at high angle of attack and that uh, will make your simulator uh, in line with the requirement, uh, the new requirement of part 60. Uh, so uh, how to train? We, we have been providing your operators with some recommendation. Uh, we obviously, you understood from my previous word, we really insist on early recognition and early recovery. This is really our motto. Uh, and then we provide some manner based exercise, and we think the best way to do it, and this is our recommendation, is to have instructor-led situation. Uh, we are also working to develop some what we can call macro or scenario, like you have the uh, wind shear scenario that you will be able to select, or the instructor will be able to select 
from the uh, instructor operating uh, station. Uh, today, we do not have any of this in some simulator manufacturer that has been validated by Airbus. Actually, we have even uh, right hand to uh, wrote to some of uh, the simulator manufacturer that we disagree with some of the scenario. Uh, for example, in one of the instructor station, we want the scenario that will bring the aircraft quite rapidly to a pitch from cruise altitude to a pitch of plus 25 degrees without moving at all the flight path. So you understand that the angle of attack will go immediately from the normal cruise one to the 25 degrees one. And this situation is not realistic at all. Actually, it was unrecoverable. So uh, we are working, but for the time being, once again, we did not validate any uh, macro or uh, scenario from the instructor station. Uh, then uh, you can understand by this word that we are very cautious on potential uh, negative transfer of training. So uh, you and we have to be very cautious on that and really assess the reality, the fidelity of the various exercise. Then uh, we also uh, want to uh, base our training on evidence. We want to base it on fact. So uh, we review all the in-service events the incident, the accident, uh, and what we found out, and that was also uh, something you can find in the IKO document, is that uh, an important part of this upset situation, or becoming upset situation, is actually an uh, inappropriate reaction from the pilot from a small disturbance. So should it be a system malfunction, uh, loss of airspeed indication, loss of autopilot? Should it be a small environmental weather change, a kind of uh, change in temperature, change in high altitude wind shear? Uh, so you have a small disturbance and the inappropriate pilot reaction will make it an upset. So that's why we also, and we are going to talk, I guess, after with Jeff about startle and surprise. Uh, that's why we want to, in the scenario-based exercise, we really want to uh, play this kind of situation. So it means that uh, here we want to really highlight the importance of pilot monitoring, of pilot awareness, and then pilot monitoring will obviously use the standard callout, but also may have to take over using uh, on our aircraft the uh, priority switch, uh, high of control, and then recover from a situation that is not at this stage, a huge upset. What we once again want to highlight is early recognition, early uh, recovery. Uh, and just uh, one example, so uh, only a few weeks ago, we have an event, um, so an aircraft, Airbus aircraft, flying in cruise, and due to a small wind change, the speed went above the MMO, just above, actually, before to have the uh, overspeed warning, but a little bit in the uh, barber pole. And then we have uh, the pilot flying reaction was to go full back stick, in a full back stick. So that's bring the aircraft to a pitch attitude of 18, 18 degrees. Uh, it was from the uh, cruise altitude. They recovered safely, safely, so the same pilots, the pilot monitoring didn't uh, take over. The same pilot was able to recover from this situation. Uh, but once again, it was just a small disturbance from the wind change and uh, just a little bit in the barber pole. So uh, here we have, uh, we'll talk about this uh, starter response. This is an issue that we have. Uh, and obviously I say the short term answer, the reaction is for, for the uh, pilot monitoring because maybe the starter will not be the same on the two different pilots. So it will, it will be surprised, but maybe not in a starter mode. Uh, and to uh, take over, take over and avoid this upset situation. But then the longer term is to uh, try to mitigate this uh, starter response, uh, to uh, mitigate this confusion that sometimes arise with a surprise, unexpected event. Uh, and for me, the answer is really uh, to go through training and to go uh, this uh, training, to, to have the pilots, uh, to be confident in his own skill uh, to uh, be able to uh, manage these uh, little events, this situation. And really, uh, for that, we, I really think that we need to 
do more training or maybe a new training scheme with much more manual flying training without flight directors uh, at high altitude. So that's mean in the simulator, actually. And this uh, will give the pilots not only back the normal handling skill we are expecting from him, but also the confidence that, for me, will really uh, fight this uh, surprise and subtle answer. So uh, that's uh, the, the Airbus, uh, let's say, position. But once again, we share uh, many of what I said with our uh, colleagues. So uh, what I said is we really focus on prevention. So it means avoidance, awareness, pilot monitoring, recognition, and early recovery. Be very cautious of potential negative training. Altogether, we have to be very cautious on that. And uh, as I said, we will provide uh, your training center, your operator, with a new data package, with a specific uh, uh, software package for the buff stall buffet model, and then aerodynamics. And together, I think we really uh, need to fight the root cause. And for me, uh, one important root cause is this uh, degradation of uh, manual flying skill without flight directors and this uh, startle response that we see more and more, uh, maybe because of lack of confidence on your own skill to uh, manage the situation. So this is uh, our position. Yeah, <clears throat> boy, you have go you've got a lot of uh, good material in there, and I, we, I think we're gonna come back to the startle issue that you bring up. I think it's, I think it's central to the, the, the training. John, you know, I look at uh, the Boeing fleet out there. You've got the 787, you've got the 777, you've got the 747-800, but you also have a lot of 737s out there, and you have a very wide, diverse fleet. What's, uh, what's Boeing's approach or uh, uh, philosophy going forward as far as uh, upset recovery training goes? Well, thank you, Chuck. Um, <clears throat> first of all, it's an honor to be here representing the Boeing company. And we do have uh, a variety of aircraft, some uh, legacy models that have uh, different uh, types of warnings and alerts, as well as the more modern aircraft that have envelope protections. Uh, I'd like to point out, first of all, though, that I apparently am the only panel member in compliance with ALPA dress code with yep. a gray suit. It was, was brought duly, up earlier noted. today, but uh, yep. I'd, I'd like a point for that one. Uh, as the fleet manager for the 737 fleet at the Boeing, company, I uh, represent uh, our training arm in flight services, and I've been asked to uh, honcho the uh, development of our extended envelope training, upset prevention and recovery training programs. Um, we have uh, over 38 Boeing-owned simulators globally with 450 instructors, either contract instructors or full-time instructors, serving uh, our customers uh, on a global basis. Uh, so it's a huge effort for us to uh, develop both the courseware curriculum, modify our simulators to meet the uh, requirement for extended envelope training. And it's, uh, it's a, a large, it's a huge uh, project actually. And I'm very excited about it actually. I think that the, uh, the skills that, uh, the soft skills if you will, that uh, come from this, with this course, with the big P as I call it, uh, prevention, uh, can be uh, emphasized, reinforced throughout our training programs uh, from day one, and that will uh, reinforce our basic flying training uh, program and our skills, in addition to supporting the uh, requirements for extended envelope training or upset prevention recovery training. I, uh, I like to prefer uh, to have a big P on UPRT, that's the additive uh, um, adjective, if you will, for our training. It started out as unusual attitudes 20 years ago. Those of us that were in the military were somewhat familiar with being upside down, but it didn't mean we knew how to uh, uh, correct an upset on a, a large transport category aircraft and evolved to uh, a simple just recovery methods, just strictly recovery, uh, to uh, upset uh, recovery training, which was a little more uh, defined, but it was still emphasizing recovery skills. Um, just a few minutes in the simulator and a check ride. Uh, let's move on uh, to more important things. And now we've uh, advanced to UPRT, and I like to make the P a big, large capital P uh, for uh, prevention and uh, recognition, uh, emphasizing some of the, even though we have a lot of technology to support prevention with envelope protected airplanes, uh, we 
even our legacy aircraft have a lot of uh, warnings, alerts, and uh, cautions that, uh, and people that scream at us when we exceed 30 degrees of bank or um, encounter wind shear or some kind of weather phenomena like that. Um, the, uh, the large P also stands for those two important people up in front of the airplane called the pilots. And uh, we want to reinforce those uh, monitoring skills that are essential to uh, prevention and awareness, uh, recognition, uh, emphasizing active monitoring for both pilots, the pilot flying and the monitoring pilot is essential in our training program. And, and we want to define that better as we uh, develop and incorporate uh, this into our uh, transition courseware. Um, threat and error management, of course, is uh, one of the cornerstones CRM to our to our training and has been for years. But uh, uh, using uh, those skills and employing those skills, looking at the threats for uh, and recognizing potential threats that can cause a loss of control in flight, whether it be a mechanical problem, an MEL, uh, even just MEL auto throttles can create a huge workload for a two pilot crew when you're used to having auto throttles that work and the sophisticated automation that we have on our airplanes. Improving our manual flying skills uh, for ourselves, our students, our customers is essential. Uh, developing the confidence needed to be able to click off the autopilot and the auto throttles and fly the airplane, knowing pitch and power settings uh, that uh, you're familiar with rather than just draw the, like we're used to now following flight director commands uh, is an important part of our uh, ongoing effort to improve our training. And with that, the automation that we've talked about a lot today, uh, a better understanding of the automation, its limitations, appropriate usage, uh, how to use it, when to use it, and uh, interface, the human uh, automation interface is really important. And again, we have the two pilots that are involved in that. It's our intention to integrate uh, the extended envelope training and the, uh, and the UPRT into our full transition courseware starting from day one, as I mentioned earlier, with both soft skills, human factors, as well as recovery techniques and scenario-based training. Uh, we'll train uh, the upset uh, and stalls and various uh, maneuvers to proficiency, but that's just part of the equation as was brought up earlier by Mark and uh, Chuck. Uh, the startle factor, the surprise factor is uh, a little more difficult in, in the simulators, uh, concern about negative transfer uh, the fact that the simulators can't uh, do everything to simulate a real flight, they certainly can't simulate negative Gs. So, uh, there are some limitations of what we can do, but we certainly can improve what we're doing now. Um, we want to integrate this completely into our course and not just tack it on as a bolt-on or, hey, you know, let's have an extra two hours and talk about and do some flying here with upsets. So we're, we're uh, incorporating it through our courseware. Um, as I mentioned, the startle and surprise effect with scenario-based training is a challenge, but it's, uh, it's doable. I myself was startled and surprised when Jeff gave me an upset flying into Reagan <laughs> here in the simulator in Oak City a couple weeks ago, and I knew it was coming. So it's, uh, it's doable. Uh, a cornerstone of our whole program is instructor training. Uh, we've developed a uh, special purpose operational training uh, scenario for our instructors to one, to, for them to experience the training and two, to qualify them as instructors. It goes beyond the uh, operation of the uh, operating station for instructors in a simulator. It's getting into the seat and actually setting up uh, uh, these scenarios and uh, a little more emphasis on the uh, monitoring pilot skills, assessing those skills, uh, uh, reinforcing that with uh, both pilots during training and not just focusing on the pilot flying as we tend to do in a Part 61 course. Uh, emphasizing uh, recognizing threats and, and uh, onset conditions that could provoke a stall or a, some kind of an upset. And you know, when we talk about the definition for an upset, the, the one that's uh, I think significant is we all know that if you have an extreme angle of bank pitch uh, or roll, uh, that's, you know, we recognize an upset when we see it, but the insidious one is the airspeed uh, for inappropriate for the phase of flight. And how many of us have found ourselves just a couple knots slow and made that correction on, on approach, maybe related to uh, gusty winds, it could be uh, just a little behind on the power, but uh, we do it, we do it very well. As, uh, our crews are extremely effective in uh, um, dealing with these kinds of situations. And it's that uh, lapse, uh, that momentary lapse that can get us into trouble that we're working with. 
At the Boeing Company, we've, uh, with our training programs, uh, we've gone through a huge paradigm shift in the last decade. I've been with Boeing nine years after retiring uh, due to forced retirement due to age discrimination from Alaska Airlines uh, nine years ago. Uh, when I got to Boeing, it was train the trainer. We had entitlement courses for uh, customers buying new jets, and, and we trained the trainer. We trained management pilots, check airmen, instructors, and sent, set them off on their way to do, uh, develop their own training programs. Well, that's shifted now to a, a greater responsibility for us to uh, provide training, uh, follow-on training to a lot of pilots uh, extreme uh, differences in, in experience and background. The, the best example I have is four Russian pilots that had a total of 150 hours each going through a 737 transition course. Obviously an extended course. Uh, they were successful. It requires a lot of mentoring and coaching from the instructor. It's, uh, it takes a special kind of instructor to, to work with uh, ab initial type pilots because they don't have those skills and background. They don't know what they need to study, what to focus on, how to prepare, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a lot of hand-holding, and uh, it's, it's what we're facing in the industry now. We've also uh, engaged uh, our uh, Boeing uh, uh, partners in Russia to do some research for us. Uh, and one of them is uh, studying motion cueing for the simulators and employing eye gazing technology. It'll be interesting to see what kind of results we get from that. Uh, they're going to develop, uh, do research on uh, and studying case studies, both incidents and accidents, and uh, come up with 20 to 25 scenarios for us to use in our uh, scenario based training. And also develop an assessment tool for uh, the effectiveness of the training we do develop. So we're, we're excited about that uh, as well. It's been a huge investment for us. Uh, I think Boeing, has, our budget's over $20 million to upgrade our simulators, develop courseware and curriculum, train our 450 instructors around the world. And uh, we're also uh, supporting uh, our customer base. So we're starting to get requests for, uh, from customers around the world for information on how to train, what we're doing. Um, some of them want to hit the easy button. Do you have something you can give us? Uh, we're in the process of, uh, process of developing our programs now and hope to uh, qualify all of our instructors by the end of uh, 2017, possibly halfway through 2018 to meet the, uh, to get ahead of the deadline in 2019. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, very good. Jan, you've, uh, same sort of question I'm going to throw to you is you, you've got the uh, uh, ERJ-130-140 series aircraft, but now you've also got the E-170-190, kind of a, a diverse fleet. Uh, what's, Embraer, uh, what's Embraer's approach towards uh, in-flight loss of control and upset recovery training? Okay. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. Uh, by no coincidence, though, our uh, philosophy and uh, emphasis is very similar to my colleagues here. And uh, we do emphasize on prevention. So awareness and rec recognition of a possible upset situation, a situation that's going to to lead to undesired aircraft state is our priority. And on that, uh, monitoring plays a, a key role, the way we understand it. So we suggest and we emphasize training on, on monitoring. So it's uh, extremely important, especially on this generation of automated aircraft and, and how is going on. But uh, just uh, awareness, awareness and recognition are not enough. So we have to, to con be concerned about also on recovery training. And uh, as Mark just said, uh, our emphasis is on the early, early recovery or early recognition of the situation. Uh, our main concern is, uh, one of our main concerns is stall. Almost all upset uh, accidents we have information about are uh, begun with a stall. And there is a big difference between uh, what we train today, that's an approach to stall, and a full developed stall. So uh, it's very important that this training be very uh, carefully prepared and, and executed. So uh, most upset, upsets, as I said, they, they begin with a stall. And uh, most people are very surprised when they, they uh, face a full stall in an aircraft of this category. So uh, the aircraft 
just before the star and uh, approach the star condition is controllable. But after a full star develops, it's out of control. So that's a, probably the beginning of an upset. We're also looking forward for the uh, new generation of, uh, not, not a new generation, but uh, uh, the simulators with the new data package are beginning operation. We have people working on that to support the C manufacturers and C operators to uh, get the simulators ready to, to the new requirements that are coming. The is that data package is, uh, is being getting ready and uh, being uh, our people and uh, was working together with the uh, sim developers and operators to 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 have them ready. One of the points that was mentioned here before also is that we do uh, we're very concerned about negative training. A lot of uh, operators they are not really aware of the limitations of their current simulators. Mm -hmm. So we hear comments about, uh, oh no, I have been using rudder like this, and so, but they don't usually are aware that the, where the, the region of the flight envelope they're using those flight controls, I really not uh, have any fidelity for, uh, to represent the real aircraft. So you must be careful with that, so better, analyze and uh, train with limitations you have today. So, also we are very concerned about star factor. Uh, looking forward to hear what Dr. Schroeder has to say about it. And of course, with creativity and uh, hard work, we can develop scenarios that are realistic and uh, they can really, and effective because uh, it's not, uh, as also Mark said, it's unrealistic scenarios are most probably will create a negative effect, not a positive one. So uh, we're also looking forward for the new uh, developing simulation technology. Mm -hmm. I have seen uh, recently developments uh, on a conventional exapod that was mounted on a turning table that could turn continuously 360 degrees. So we would add some uh, physiological effects on the pilots also, uh, more effective uh, motion cues. Also some simulators that have a, a cockpit with, uh, mounted with a gimbal in a centrifuge. So we could provide, uh, could simulate and, uh, and uh, provide the feeling of up to plus three Gs, continuous three Gs during maneuvers. So that would probably be very helpful because the training on the aircraft is very effective, so the pilot can have the feeling for those who didn't come from the military, doesn't have any military background, that never experienced all altitude and inverted flights or Gs. Uh, th those simulators that can give up to three Gs continuously is a, probably a very good tool. And also they uh, simulate the mechanics and uh, flight mechanics and uh, uh, inertias and all those uh, other effects that you don't have in a light aerobatic aircraft. So aircraft training is very positive, but we'll be lacking some of the characteristics of the heavy transport aircraft. And uh, well, basically is it, that's it. Uh, most of our concerns are very aligned with the concerns of our uh, colleagues here. This, is, this has been a very productive and positive collaboration uh, in this particular matter. And, uh, was, was an extol recovery. So that's basically what you have in mind. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, you bring in some interesting things ab about uh, G-loading and some of those aspects that now we are kind of uh, pushed into the, the simulated world. How do we replicate actual conditions out there? So Jeff, last I heard, the FAA doesn't actually build airplanes or sell airplanes, but they certainly have a lot to say about how they're built and who flies them. A common theme that I've, I've seen through, our, uh, through uh, Mark, John, and Jan is number one, prevention and startle factor. 
So I'm interested to hear what your take is on some of the human factors issues that go into developing this program and how can we leverage our knowledge on human factors and training in the future for upset recovery training. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, first, thanks for having me. Um, it's one of my favorite events, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, before I talk about startle and surprise, I'll ask you a question. Uh, just shout it out. What, what, what warning in the cockpit can you think of that you think no matter how surprised or startled you are, you're not going to miss? Your dinner is ready, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. If your dinner's ready, Cap, your dinner's ready, Captain. Anybody? Oral. Oral shaker. Okay, very good. I was hoping I would get a shaker. Uh, I know, uh, to, just to illustrate how powerful the surprise and startle event is, I know of two events in the last five years that were significant upsets in which the crew has no recollection of the shaker going off, but it went off. In one of them, uh, I've talked to both of the pilots, and neither one of them has a recollection of the shaker going off. So um, startle and surprise can be very powerful. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about are, are three things. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about it, uh, is, is why should we try to do our best to train for startle or surprise. Uh, second, I'm going to do my best to discuss how, and then the last, uh, give my opinions on whether I think it's going to work. Uh, so the first item, and I'm going to give you a short answer for each and a long answer, so I'm going to cater to all learning styles. Um, so the first, first item is, why should we include surprise in our upset training? Uh, and the short answer to that is uh, because your government says so. Uh, any questions? No? Okay. Item one, check. Okay, the long answer is uh, a startle and surprise, as you probably know, have, uh, they, they ex appear explicitly in the discussions of the accident reports of Colgan, Air France, Asiana, and Air Asia. And apparent confusion uh, in the cockpit that's led to unexpected control actions was also a factor in other pretty famous upset accidents, most outside the United States, but namely Flash Air, Atom Air, Kenya Airways, Aeroflot Nord, Gulf Air, uh, RM Avier, West Caribbean XL, and Turkish. And that's not a complete list. And so it's, it's, it's certainly a, a factor. So shouldn't we um, do the best that we can to try to, to try to train for it? or have scenarios that kind of replicate it. Okay, this next item is how should we do it? The short answer is uh, you, you really look at the definition of what surprise is, and that's how you do it. And you, you create an expectation, and then you violate it. So sometimes that takes very careful, sneaky bastard instructors to create the expectation, and I know there's a lot of you out there. <laughs> you need to share your techniques with everyone. But that's how you create surprise. Um, some have made the statement that uh, unless you add the risk of dying in a simulator, you won't be able to train for startle and surprise. So you might not have read our recent rule that's about to come out where we're increasing the risk of you dying and not being able to return to your family <laughs> at night. You, you, you discuss, you create problems and we create solutions. Okay, so um, I would be the first to admit that if in-flight surprise or startle was here and simulation surprise and startle was here, that will never close the gap. But I think we can do better than what we do now. And whether or not it's going to be enough is really going to be a to be determined exercise. But I think right now the gap is pretty big. Um, some of you incorporated, I know, the best that you can. But now that we try to make it more prevalent across industry, I think that uh, hopefully we can do a little bit better job uh, in, in simulating. So, so I certainly understand that view. Um, 
avoiding predictable events that uh, allow, uh, avoiding predictable events and those that allow memorization of solutions. That's another way. Another problem with creating surprise and startle is uh, uh, in the Twitter generation, uh, you surprise the first person and then they tell everybody what it is and you don't surprise anybody else afterwards. So another way that you can possibly do this, and we've done this in exercises and workshops, is try to create scenarios where, where what you perceive uh, can be due to multiple things. So you create branch points for those scenarios so that trainee A comes in and gets branch one, trainee B gets branch two, and so on. So it really becomes a rock, paper, scissors exercise. You never really know what's, what you're going to possibly get. But the instructor can be very helpful and try to, to, try to set that up. And I'll, I'll, give, I'll, give you one, I'll give you an example. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about realism because that was brought up a couple times. Mm -hmm. And here's where I'm probably going to be a little uh, controversial and make people mad. But that's my job, I'm a regulator. Um, so I want to make it clear, and it's in our guidance, I think we should always strive for realistic scenarios because they, they minimize the law of unintended consequences. Um, they don't potentially damage someone's psyche by uh, reducing their competence at the end of the training session. However, I'm not completely convinced that we should shackle ourselves to 100% realism. So why do I think that? Well, first, it's because one of my favorite quotes is, things that can never happen happen all the time. So how do you know this, that you, what you think is unrealistic truly is unrealistic? There are some examples that are. Mark gave a great example. I don't know of a way physically I can get the airplane to go immediately to 20 degrees pitch without a change in flight path. So we can rule those kind of things out. But there are some scenarios that are a little more of a gray area that might allow you to drive an academic point home in an effective manner if, if it's done carefully. Uh, the second reason is, um, you know, remember this is just training, not checking. So you have to have the mindset that, you know, we're not trying to do a gotcha for people. Um, so um, I, I know that's one aspect of why people like to do something that's realistic, because they kind of have a checking mindset, and am I going to be penalized if I'm doing something that's, you know, it's completely out of the box and you're checking that. We're not checking any of this. It's all, it's all just training. Uh, what I have seen and what does concern me about this, and I share uh, the unreal, uh, unrealism concerns, is, is we've, we have surprised some people who start off the simulator session very talkative and they're happy and everything, and all of a sudden we've surprised them and I see them go silent. And we continue the training on something else, and they stay silent. And then I had one person turn and ask me, you know, that thing that we did back there, could that really happen? So I can tell that, you know, I've, I've affected maybe the value of the training. And so an instructor has to be very careful if you use something that might be a little bit out of the box that you don't damage someone's fragile psyche. It's a bell curve, you know, we have all types, right? Um, and the third is, I think you have to balance the risk of unintended consequences against the risk that they didn't get it. And a case in point is the scenario that we kind of do stall scenarios in Oklahoma City is we kind of, we throw a hot potato stall in their lap. Typically what, what you go through maneuvers training, and you pull the power, you slow down, you get the shaker, you recover. Everybody knows the shaker's going to cover. You're, you're anticipating it. But when people are surprised, when we have an event where you've quickly blown through a lot of those cautions and warnings, somehow you've missed them. Now we're trying to create this, these states that have actually occurred operationally in the NAS. How is somebody going to react? And we know from the from the accident history, that they are not reacting like they're training. So can we create a scenario like that that might be on the borderline of not that realistic, but it evaluates whether or not 
if they get there suddenly, they respond like they're trained. And if not, it can drive a point home that, oh, I always have to respect the shaker by reducing angle of attack, no matter what the situation is. So those are the three things. Now, I don't want the takeaway from this to, to be, uh, the FAA is saying we should train unrealistic scenarios. Uh, I started this off by saying definitely strive for realism. But if you're very careful, I don't think we should be shackled 100 by 100% 100 realism. The last thing I want to talk about is will including surprise in our upset training work? Short answer is, yeah, I think it will somewhat. The long answer is, I've, witten, I've witnessed in this particular example, talk about Stahl, a, a um, highly trained 737 pilot come in that we've given him a surprise stall, and he was definitely surprised. Um, he got into, our, our, our advanced uh, models have fairly significant roll-off capability, and some of the accidents have shown pilots get into the roll axis because they go unstable, and they, when you have an axis that goes unstable, you try to control it. That's exactly what this pilot did. He got into a full-blown roll pilot-induced oscillation, and his mind, you get, we have audio of it, him saying, get the nose down, get the nose down, get the nose down, and he's got the, he's got the uh, column back in his lap. And afterwards, he said, you know, my, my brain was telling me one thing, my body was doing another, and it really taught me that getting the nose down is the number one thing. And, and he was fine in maneuver training. So that's sort of that case that I talked about of balancing that risk of the realism versus did the person really get the take home message. Um, our ability to surprise people has been pretty good. Um, we did a study where we brought in 45 type rated 737 pilots, gave them this type, gave them this uh, uh, surprise scenario. Afterwards, we asked them to assess the following statement. I was surprised by that event and they rated on a scale from one to seven where seven was strongly agree and six was agree, I only got sixes and sevens. 37 of the 45 pilots rated to seven, but that was, they strongly agreed, and the remaining eight rated to six. So I think we can do it. Whether we can do it repeatedly is a little more challenge. Uh, a NASA study you might be aware of uh, also talked about the value of mixing it up. Um, two of their nine pilots um, rejected the takeoff uh, after V1, uh, when it came unexpectedly. I mean, usually you, get your, usually you don't get a V1 cut on the first takeoff of the day. They mixed it up and they gave V1 cuts on the first takeoff of the day. In that, in that instance, two of the nine uh, bore the takeoff after V1. So what good might it offer? Um, it might teach some self-awareness. You know, there was an aviation study that came out two years ago that showed that when you're stressed, you start visually searching all over the place. You just kind of, you're looking kind of for what's going on and you tend to kind of gravitate towards a bottom-up sol problem-solving approach instead of trying to maintain your focus and use a top-down approach. And if you experience that, if you think you don't have that characteristic and maybe the startle training shows you might, it can lead to some self-awareness. It might also lead to some introspection. Now I realize most pilots are male and so the chances of that are probably slim. <laughs> um, but there was another study that two, two years ago uh, that showed um, that you might be able to learn some effective problem solving skills in, in, in situations outside of aviation. Uh, and I can tell you more about that if you're interested. So in summary, why do it? Because your government says so. How to do it? Because um, create an expectation, violate it, and will it work? I think it will somewhat. Yeah, fabulous, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, we have just under 15 minutes. I would certainly like to draw some of you into the discussion. I know there's a lot of uh, questions. Uh, many of the airline pilots out there fly these three, uh, three manufacturers. Um, as people are considering coming to the mic or uh, with, with questions, um, and I'll start with you, Jeff, but I want to, I want to hear from uh, the three manufacturers. Um, what, um, with the flight, uh, flight envelope protections that the manufacturers are now instituting, um, how much of our, the, the raw maneuverability that we used to teach in traditional flight control systems 
how do we how do we deal with that evolution coming in? And then I'd like to hear what the manufacturers say uh, on flight uh, the, the role of flight envelope protection and uh, uh, the fact that in some cases you have to disable the aircraft systems to introduce that, that training scenario in there? Well, it's a very good question. It comes up uh, often. Um, although I'm not a lawyer, I can give a legal answer and then my opinion. Right. Uh, the legal answer is it um, doesn't matter what make model series you fly, the training is required for everybody. Right. So if you fly 330 or 350, you got to do, do the F7 maneuvers. How to do it, uh, we're still kind of working to figure that out. Um, when, when we do it with our 330 simulator in Oklahoma City, we kind of do it like the flight test pilots do it first, which uh, that simulator, a lot, that, and it's not a specialized simulator for this purpose, but it, it allows you to synthetically go into the reduced, the degraded mode. So you can kind of see everything working mm -hmm. and not be uh, shackled with the with the not having a display kind of thing. And so you can get the feel of the airplane. So we kind of start with that. And frankly, we haven't progressed to what kind of failures mm -hmm. make sense. And we've been working with Airbus to try to come up with some recommendations for that. Uh, uh, John or Jan, any thoughts on that as well, as far as particularly in the fly-by-wire uh, models? Uh, you know, how do you, what is your focus on the envelope protected airplanes as, as far as your training goes is how you introduce an upset uh, for training purposes? Well, that's a dilemma we face with the current generation of E-Jets. E-Jets are from E-170 to E-195. Is that you only have a normal mode and direct mode. Mm -hmm. And uh, to push a situation where you have a full stall developed, you have to switch off the normal mode. So uh, then we fall into this, maybe we're falling into a trap because it's not realistic or... So it's, it's a kind of dilemma we face, so... It's a complicated answer. It, right. Yeah. John, thoughts? Uh, envelope protected airplanes are pretty sophisticated in a, uh, cascading failures that would result in somehow with malfunctions in the in a direct mode mm -hmm. from a normal mode or a secondary mode would be uh, very unusual. And uh, the only, what we're looking at right now, developing the training to comply with the, uh, uh, the training requirement is to uh, actually just put the airplane in the direct mode and just show the pilots how it responds in a, in a direct mode. As we say, it flies like a 6.7 instead of an 8.7 or a 7.7 uh, to get back to those kind of basics because we're used to having the envelope protections. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, aircraft like the 737, of course, uh, it's easier. There are some uh, controls. Uh, the um, the uh, elevator field shift, for example, you have to hold it into a stall to feel the increased pressure on the yoke. But uh, yeah, that's a it's a concern. We haven't worked through all of that yet, to be honest with you. Yeah. Mark, uh, any thoughts from you? Yes, uh, clearly the uh, aircraft are protected when everything is working fine. So uh, we insert uh, failures, so multiple failures that will. Uh, uh, lead you to go to the uh, reversion mode, so the alternate mode, and then the direct mode if needed. We think that uh, uh, we, we have to do some uh, manual flying uh, uh, training uh, in all the modes. So we do it in uh, low altitude, high altitude, in normal low, in alternate low, and in direct low. Uh, what, what we try to make sure that we provide the simulator manufacturer or what are the best, uh, let's say, uh, training-oriented failure uh, to, to be used uh, in this scenario. Uh, as uh, Jeff said, we also have some specific switch in which you can go directly in alternate low without any failure. Uh, so uh, what you say maybe is not 100% realistic, but when you just want to do some demonstration and not on a scenario base, that's also something that, that you can use. But once again, uh, envelope protected aircraft is not an excuse for not being capable of basic flying skill. So clearly, uh, we have failure. That's the answer when we do the uh, safety, uh, system safety assessment. The answer to the failure is very easy on the manufacturer standpoint is the pilot will take over. So clearly, uh, envelope protected or not, we still need to have pilot capable of manual flying without flight director at any altitude. Thank you. We have a couple questions, so I'll start with you, sir. 
Hi, uh, great panel. Uh, Brian Burks from Alaska Airlines. I heard consistently from all the panelists the importance of preventing negative transfer of training and clear understanding of the training objective and the limitation and capability of the device. And I know it's very complicated to come up with that, but at the end of the day, the delivery of this training will be with an instructor in a flight training device. And what kind of assurances can we offer to the training community that we can train our trainers, the instructors, so they can see these event sets, they clearly understand the aerodynamic principles behind them, they're not just doing a check the box exercise, but each maneuver is a clear objective and the training is there to support that. Because at the end of the day, that implementation is the most important part. How do we as an industry provide better guidance to our instructors who provide this training? Any comments? Anybody want to jump in on that? That's a great question. I, uh, our plan is to uh, create a cadre of uh, mentors, I, as I mentioned, who, uh, to help one standardize our program. And, and I believe that the, uh, the key to success is really with our instructors. Uh, years passed with uh, unusual attitudes and uh, upset recovery training as a check the box exercise. And uh, we want to uh, increase the understanding and awareness of uh, this important, uh, uh, these training uh, requirements. I don't know how much time it'll take to train our instructors, but we're not gonna dilute the impact or the quality of instruction by just having one instructor cascade the training and train another instructor. We're gonna have a nucleus of instructors that travel to our campuses and train our instructors uh, to keep it standardized and uh, on track. Jan, any comments? Yeah, what I have seen around the world is that uh, the airlines that already adopted a training program, they have a specific training program for the instructor, uh, much extended compared to the line pilot that involves a lot of aerodynamic uh, deeper training and uh, most of them are going to fly real aircraft for those who never had experience to, to uh, experience inverted all, all altitude flights and they have a very different program for the instructors and for, for the line pilots. Mark, any thoughts? Oh, I, I totally agree, uh, both with the question and with the statement. Obviously, the uh, most important part, most important element in the successful training is the instructor. So we are ready to invest a lot in the instructor. Uh, on training, but also on tools that we can provide to him uh, with the instructor uh, station, the operating instructor station, having what we call the valid training envelope. So also give you elements where you are outside uh, the, the right fidelity of the, the simulation. Uh, but once again, the most important part is the instructor. Yep. Very good. I want to go to this question over here. Yes, sir. Paul Kolish, uh, RAA and Endeavor Air. And uh, I had to come to the mic because Jeff called me by name. Uh, <laughs> in 2010, when we started with the stall working group, at one point I was talking about some of our uh, methods for surprising people in a simulator. And from across the room, he looked at me with his head tilted as it is now and said, you sneaky bastards. <laughs> and so I wear that as a badge of honor. When we were working on the airplane state awareness group, toward the end of that, at one point, Mike Snow from Boeing said, gee, it seems to me that in every case, the pilot was surprised. In all the cases we looked at, we were looking at, I think, 17. And I said, well, that's right, because if we'd known it was coming, we wouldn't have gone. Now, I'm delighted that we've gone from people almost cursing at me in 2010 when I talked about surprising people in the simulator because it was nasty to it becoming a common area of discussion. But it's going to require some thought. And part of it, uh, Jeff alluded to, that between the front and the back of the cockpit there ha uh, in the simulator, there has to be confidence that we're working toward the same goal. That I'm not trying to get you, except I am, in order for you to have an experience that will be really valuable because if you have something bad go wrong, it's probably going to surprise you in the airplane. And so that's going to require a real change of thought in a lot of training situations because by and large, we're very disciplined. We have procedures, we have flows, we do it this way and not that. We have certain vernacular. But 
in order to surprise people, you have to violate that. And you have to give your instructors some free reign, which also just seems foreign to us in the airline business. But it's really important if you want to surprise people. Right, Paul, if I could just jump in, because we've got just a, yep. a moment. But I, I want uh, I, to get that mindset or make that change that you're describing, any ideas in, in the few moments that we have left on ad addressing that and, and, and seeing a, a mindset change? Is the mindset change already there, do you think? Or is it, do we have work to do on the mindset change? I what think I have we have a lot of work to do. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, what I have seen that was, uh, I think, was effective is that some airlines, they had a dedicated session for that, for upset recovery training. And after that session, the maneuvers were incorporated in the normal periodic training. So on the first, this first dedicated session, it was clear that uh, the training was different. So you could be surprised. It's a different mindset, as the gentleman just said there. So the introduction was something, and then when it was incorporated into the uh, normal training, periodic training, uh, they, they knew they already could expect this because it was a different approach for a different problem. So. John? Well, I think it comes down to how, how we set this scenario up if for maneuver training. Of course, we're training them uh, what our objectives are, how to recover the event sets uh, as we go through the, the maneuver training and train to proficiency, get opportunity to practice, get comfortable with manual flying again and, and uh, supporting each other, and then setting the stage for uh, scenario-based training later on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the gotcha question is, is a good one. Um, and none of us want to be embarrassed, especially in the simulator. I'm pretty smart when I'm sitting back in the back of the simulator, but I'm kind of stupid up front. So it, uh, it's important. But now how we set this latest stage for that is, a, is part of the. Jeff, where are we? Are we, setting, are we setting a change in mindset, do you think, in your view? I think we're getting there. Uh, I've worked with a lot of operators so far, and I'm, I'm pretty happy in the direction it's going. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet. I'm hopeful. Okay. Mark, last word. Any, where do you no, think I totally going? agree. And, uh, this is not a um, manufacturer specific activity. So it's an activity that we have to do all together uh, to find what uh, could be the realistic scenario, uh, like we did some 20 years ago for the, the loft uh, when we, we introduced that. Uh, I think that uh, we, we are on the right path. We are on the right path. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, time does not permit us to go much further, so uh, I'd like uh, to have you join me in thanking our panel for a very, very good discussion.